This is the story of exceptional women working for their communities and the legacy of Clarendon Chambers Studios that is still a place of dance and music today. The Midlands Institute for the Blind was started by two Quaker women, Mary Chambers and Lucy Marie Woods, 180 years ago. And this building provided accommodation, training and support to thousands of blind and partially sighted people. They developed the existing building as needs changed and in 1905 they added a purpose-built concert hall, today's dance studio. Nora was born in 1917, one of three sisters, Violet, Tess and Nora Morrison. All the sisters went to ballet classes, but Nora's talents were spotted at an early age and she relished the challenges that ballet presented to her. She quickly established herself locally as a talented dancer and started teaching at Betty Sisson's Dance School at the very early age of 13, becoming the senior dance teacher after Betty's death. Nora set up her first independent dance school in 1940. At first, we were at a room on Mansfield Road. Then we moved into the Blue Coat School in 1955. Miss Morrison was head girl there when she was younger, and the headmaster, Major Merlers, was happy to provide a room for her. Nora had started work at the Royal Midlands Institute for the Blind in 1934, when she was just 16 years old. Here started a relationship with the Institute that lasted over 80 years. At first, she assisted with administration and work with members of the blind community. She quickly volunteered to teach blind students how to dance, combining her love of dance and supporting everybody to participate. The Institute for the Blind was a place of learning, living and developing, with concert shows performed by members or visiting groups. Dance and exercise took place in the concert hall, in the gymnasium and even on the roof. Nora balanced her work at the Institute and running her dance classes. She had immediately started to raise funds for the blind through her annual shows. In 1955, the Blue Coat School announced it was moving out of its home. What would happen to Nora's dance school? Nora and her sisters searched for a new venue but found nothing suitable. Then the Blind Institute came to their rescue. Residential accommodation at the Institute had closed and they were able to offer the first floor space on Chaucer Street to Nora. As Nora was still working there, this was perfect. Challenges came again when in the 1980s, the Blind Institute decided to move out to Radford. They sold the building to the council and the Chaucer Street building was earmarked for a new women's centre. But not to lose the famous Morrison School of Dance, the council offered Nora the old concert hall for her classes. There she stayed until 2013. So you actually found this place for us, didn't you? When was that? I mean, it wasn't that long ago, was it? No, it wasn't. It was... Um... December, I'd been to a meeting at the Women's Centre, came out, walked up the road and um, saw the sign. I thought, ooh, <laughs> they've got rooms for hire. Exactly I'll ring them. we were looking for. Yeah, yeah, I'll ring them, rang them up. I walked in here in this space and it, it didn't look like this at the time, but I just went, oh! God, this is a golden space. Yeah, I remember you sending me the photos yeah. and, and it was as if I was here with you coming into the room, but you told me about just the feeling walking in there and just, just the general vibe in the place. Yeah. This this room has got so much history yeah. and a legacy of dance and you being a dancer, you oh, know, we were absolutely. bringing in some, the, some of the dance that we're doing today, but it had a history of dance. You, you can feel that that wonderful history in here and it feels like we're walking in the footsteps of a giant here, you know, with the history that goes with it and it's like it's a privilege to be here and it's such a beautiful space to uh, dance in, just to, to breathe in. It's just a lovely space. 
my earliest memories of Miss Morrison were that she was quite kind and had a good sense of humour, but she could be a bit scary. She was she was very particular about everything as well. Elegant, strict, older than I anticipated, but incredibly vital. I mean, she must have been in at least in her 70s when I joined. And she was so direct and competent and spry. And even though there was this frailness about her, that old world elegance that only comes from women bred in that time. You know how truly extraordinary Hollywood actresses of the 1920s, those that lived into their dotage, how they just seemed to exude elegance and poise and sophistication without making you feel inferior. She had that. The hair was always beautifully coiffed, but it never looked like she tried. Her makeup was always beautifully done. She always had jewellery on. There were always earrings, always slightly laddered tights, because I think she probably put them on in a rush in the morning. Elegant, graceful, petite and and sweet. I just remember all of the the, the clothes that she used to wear, she'd always have these tiny little heels on. You'd never see her in flat shoes. She was always in heels and she just, her hair was always so beautiful and it was up and in a bun and she'd just, it looked like she was gliding across the room. I can remember the first time I, I met her and I thought, oh my God, she never can teach, but she was so professional. She was so welcoming and so nice, yeah. you know, and she's hopping around the room. Yeah. She was brilliant, yeah. I, to this day, would never know how old Miss Morrison was one night when she was teaching me. No idea. We always used to have conversations, how old's Miss Morrison? How old's Miss Morrison? It was just like a myth within the school. She was the complete quintessential supporting ballet teacher that you can imagine. She had a presence that, I guess, was ethical. And so you had to live up to that standard and perform to that standard. Just sheer perfection as a ballet teacher, I would say. Nora was just so easy with them. She, <laughs> I think she loved you all. I think she really did. I felt loved by her. Yeah. I felt really safe and happy coming in here. Miss mm. Morrison, I, I remember being very kind, um, very welcoming to me. When I first joined. She really was this inspirational human being and these are tears of happiness like I'm, I'm remembering our time there and it just was pure magic like our childhood was as magical as it could be. What I remember of Miss Morrison was her storytelling. So in in the dance, we would always be creating a story. So um, I remember, you know, she would talk about it's a really cold morning and you go and you wash your face with, with cold water because that helps to warm you up. And um, so even though she was very strict and we always felt like we needed to... Um, be on our best behaviour in front of her. <laughs> um, she had a real warmth and, um, and that kind of storytelling really stuck with me, I think. Every child to Miss Morrison was special. Whatever your ability, we were special to her. With Miss Morrison, she taught very good R.A.D. ballet traditionally and wonderfully and explored all types of storytelling and interpretation through music and dance. Her common phrases were, pull your socks up, has everyone met? You don't want to look like the back end of a bus. I think those were her three main phrases and all the other students will laugh at that because um, that is so true. Yeah. I became deaf when I was Stefan. And my mum thought I'd have to give up uh, ballet. But we talked to Miss Morrison and she said, why would you have to give up? I said, but I can't hear the music. Oh, that doesn't matter. Just follow the person in front. So that's what I did. This is what was wonderful about Miss Morrison. She never stopped any of her students going off to pursue. 
And I've taught in schools where they're like, no, we don't want them auditioning. We don't want to lose them. They're good for our school name. And she never did that, which was really, really fantastic. And that's why she had so many of us go off to various schools and have various arts careers. She just didn't like to do dancing on one spot. She wanted you to, do, to dance all over. She wanted you to use the space. Everything was about opening up your, your, your heart and dancing with your heart, with expression, and, you know, firing your imagination and your creativity. That was important to her. She didn't just like steps and, you know, counting on all that. No. It was more... It was more like what comes from here. Never mind about technique so much, but what's important is you, you dance from here. That that is actually what gets you into the, the, the professional stage, anyway. So yeah. I remember it as a wonderful, spectacular, shiny, wonderful time. But parents remember it as, as a highly stressful moment with everyone screaming at everyone and nobody doing what they're supposed to do, and nothing's ready. And then somehow it's all right on the night. Which it always was. The Carpentry Arts Theatre, we did the shows once a year in October for a whole week to start with when I was little. We had dress rehearsal on a Sunday and then we ran right through to the following Saturday every evening. And it was always in Miss Morrison's birthday week. There were musical numbers incorporated into it. There was acting, there was singing, there was dancing. It wasn't a show, and lots of schools create shows where it's number after number. Mm. This section is the ballet section. This section is the modern section. This is, Miss Morrison wanted an actual theatrical experience, and she created them. She wrote, she directed, she produced all of the all of the dance. I mean, she did. She was, yeah, she was a one woman show herself. It was quite extraordinary. That was the best thing about Morrison's the show, the lead up to the show. Because um, we used to all practice and have fun and the routine. And then we would join the younger groups with the older groups. So everyone would dance together in some pieces. So we got to meet up with everybody and everyone sharing the same passion. And it was very creative as well. And being with the older actors and actresses and being a part of the ensemble that they were doing. As a child, it felt like the biggest show on the planet and of your life every single year. It was like, I think as a child, it was like something like attending the bloody Oscars or something. It was just such a big point of the year that everybody got involved in. You definitely felt like you were part of something big. Um, I also remember it was like the, the backstage busyness as well and all the parents um, trying to keep us in line and you know doing our makeup I think there's a big commitment from the parents we we kind of provided everything for it and then bought all the tickets to watch it <laughs> I think <laughs> there was a discipline there and it's you know moving on to becoming a performer and a director you know it made me who I am because it was about how you tell stories without any words it's amazing how the sh the sh oh, she pulled the shows off because she um, rehearsed in this small room and then you've got a dress rehearsal at mm. the venue for that morning. And this show was just amazing. All the shows were just amazing. And on time. Yeah, on time, the timing, everything was just brilliant. She was a genius. She was. Every year when we did the show, she always, the money that she got as profit went to the blind. Mm. And I can remember one time she said, we've given a hundred thousand. And I thought, wow, you know, because it was like a thousand pound or whatever, or two thousand pounds profit. And that was a lot of money back in that time, you know. I participated in lots of the annual shows um, and it was quite a family affair because my dad used to help out a lot behind the scenes and backstage and you'd have so many costumes, which that some of the mums would make and the costumes were amazing really amazing and it just so much work could go into the shows it was such a special time and so much fun like i i loved it it was so exciting though on the show days i remember being in the wings and being in the um, the changing rooms at the back of um the stage the crop of arts theater is particularly magical mm -hmm. which feels like a rabbit warren at the back of there and 
yeah, just the feeling of being in the wings and going on stage. It's, it was so exciting at a young age to be doing that. During the uh, shows, there was a lovely um, atmosphere in the green room, if you like, and in the bar, because there was a bar. That, yes, you can imagine. So, and we'd seen it so many times after a week, you know, you think, well, I think I'll go and have a drink. <laughs> go and have a, a gin before we finish. Me and Miss Marston had a repertoire of thousands of dancers for, for all of us for the competition. And Tess, her sister, made all the costumes. I mean, it was a phenomenal operation. I made a lot of the costumes over the years. I made so many, many costumes, not only for my children, but for the ballet school also, along with other, other, um, other mums who could sew and sewing at home till, till 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> My mum made the costumes, but we would make the hats, um, you know, get our fingers burnt, uh, using the glue gun, trying to do our Thailand hats, or this Thai dance we did, you know, Victorian hats, roses that we'd make out of ribbons. I mean, Ardine's got a lot of money out of us. <laughs> <laughs> Because we've got a grown child and they change in th shoes every two, three months. Mm. Yeah. The two twos weren't, weren't penny. No, they're quite expensive. Mm. Beautiful stuff. Harding Stanswear, it's been here on these premises for over 40 years. And I've been here for 36 years. Well, this is a point shoe. It's heavy, hard. Mm. People think they've got metal or wood or something in them, but they haven't. It's just um, hessian and glue. It's layers of glue that make them hard so, so that they can flat. stand like that. I've never seen one of these before. They're very uncomfortable. That is a proper tutu, and we have somebody who makes those. Whenever they're in a competition, they have to have a proper tutu. They need to stand out, you know. Miss Tess, as every student would know, was hardcore. But she was at the same time equally the backbone of Miss Morrison's School of Dance and supported Miss Morrison as if they were like one. So you had Miss Morrison, who is this, um, you know, profound, bold, uh, at the same time gentle ballet teacher. Um, and then you had this hardcore sister who was the accountant who would not let you get away with anything. And that was Miss Tess. I've never seen such a warrior in a lady. It was like chalk and cheese. Miss Morrison was the fairy princess and Tess was the ogre in the office. I mean, parents were scared of Tess. That's the best way of describing it. Whereas Miss Morrison was the face of the school and the artistic side, Tess was the business. And the two of them together were formidable. She actually made sure no one um, hurt Miss Morrison or, or, you know, she was very protective over Miss Morrison. On a Saturday afternoon, in the middle of the lesson, it must be a set time, Tess brought Nora's tea in, and it would be something like two prunes and a cracker. It was a really, <laughs> really frugal tea. Half a boiled egg for her lunch or something. <laughs> She was an unsung hero, really, heroine, wasn't she, yeah. Tess? Because she did a lot of the work. I have quite a few memories of Miss Tess. I always remember thinking that she was the complete opposite of um, of Miss Morrison. And when she was sitting in the, uh, her tiny little office that was just full of stuff, anything, and quite dusty, and she was just there. She never seemed to move. It's like she just lived in that room. Well, I came in quite a bit because Ruth would be dancing and Lynn would probably either be in the room with her or downstairs, and I used to come and pay Miss Tess. She let me sit down and we'd be talking and then she'd fall to sleep while I was talking and then uh, wake up and keep talking. She used to come out and tell me all her, her life story sometimes. So those were the days. Someone had to ask who was the most uh, influential person in my life and my children, my children's, apart from parents, of course. It would be Miss Morrison, honestly.
Honestly, you know, we were here for years. She showed me how to teach. And I think now I look back at it, it was such a long time ago, but she, she was a great teacher, everything about her. And I think with my career as a teacher as well, I've taken tips from her. I work for a theatre arts company where I teach singing, dancing and drama. And I think that my dancing with Nora has started that all off and I still love it. Dance is still a passion of mine. I just, I love it. That's all because of Nora, really. I still teach everything now. I still try to keep it versatile like M Miss Morrison was. So I teach ballet, so contemporary, jazz, tap, commercial, other than that, street dance, hip hop. I teach all age groups. I teach from free to adult. There's a big difference in teaching from now to back then. When we used to come into dance, that's all the dance teacher had to do was teach us how to dance. Now I feel like because of society today, we're now teaching, we, not only are we teaching kids how to dance, we have to mentor them, learning body basics, life skills, as well as dancing. It's more of a therapy session these days than a um, simple dance class to express yourself. Yeah, she was a good role model for me. But it was Miss Morrison that she was, she still bettered my, my love of the arts, really, and theatre and dance and performing. And later becoming a director, sometimes she's there. I was ready to leave when I left. Miss Morrison had taken me as far as she could and I wanted more. And as I said, she never stopped students going, but I think what I needed was really hardcore training and I needed male role models. She opened my world to everything, to music, to art, to culture, to my feminine side. Appreciate my sentence when I say our biggest thanks must go to the writer, the producer and the principal, Morrison School of Dancing, Miss Nora Morrison. When I first walked into this place, there was something quite magical about it. The energy, I mean, was there straight away. It was like, and I can tell you this, it's like a golden space to me. And then having then learnt about Miss Morrison and her journey and what she did here, we, I truly believe we walk in the footsteps of a giant here. You know what I mean? And we're taking it and continuing that journey. and and exploring more dance styles outside of belly dance and I'm also learning different dance styles as well and I think that's a great legacy for her that's going to be continued yeah what we see for this place what we envisage for um, the dance studio at Clarendon Chambers is to fill it with connection mm. creativity culture mm. there's something for me that was really nostalgic I'm obviously not from Nottingham but I recognize this sort of space. There's something about the ballet bar, there's something about knowing how much warmth and care and community kind of is, is growing here, you know, on a week by week basis. I think that it just feels, it feels for this particular Dancing Through Time kind of work that we've been doing, it feels beautifully nostalgic and it just feels like it's um, very respectful to the space as well. Never done this before. <laughs> no, new and exciting. And I just needed to take myself away from the stresses of the seriousness of the real world mm -hmm. and get lost in this space like I normally do. For me, I've, I've never done ballet before either, so this is a new thing for me. And it's not something that growing up that we saw. Mm. Black ballet dancers was just not a thing. So for me to try something so different and out of my comfort zone mm. has been absolutely brilliant and excellent and I've loved wafting across. <laughs> Recently actually I've started dancing again, um, just started last week actually ballet and then next week starting tap. The belly dance came in when I was probably a little bit too old to be going to clubs. I think that's that's why I sort of really got into the belly dancing because it all, it's always been in me. And I suppose it was the social side of it and the dressing up and 
really, I mean, when it started, when belly dance started, it, I think I went into it whoosh, 100%. It was pretty full on, you know, just because it feels so comfortable. I mean, that's always been my home where there's been dance. It's, it's been the, it's been my escape. Um, through some pretty bad times, and when you when you couldn't or didn't want to talk to anybody, if you just came and danced, you got that time just to forget. Particularly do, do, during COVID, I could feel myself sort of um, sinking a bit. Um, although I did have a network even then, I think that was important because we did video dance. So there was still a little bit of a link and a, and a network going on. Um, and I think that got all of us through. If that hadn't have been around, you know. But the times when there hasn't been dance, I can feel my age creeping in. But when I'm dancing, there's no age. What do you think of the space? And I've never been in before and I feel an idiot for, for, for not coming here. It's got some real vibes coming through the floor. Yeah, it has, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Morrison would be so thrilled to learn that her school today is being used as a dance school. It's still going on. And she'll be even more thrilled to know that it is a diverse dance school, that you have so many different people and different dances and instruments and music from around the world, whether it's belly dancing, free movement, ballet and drums. She would be so thrilled because that is what Miss Morrison was about. You go to all the cultures, you go to all the places, everybody dances. It's the norm. You go to Spain, you go to a festival, the whole family's out, kids, dada, grandma, everybody's having a good time. So for me, that's how I was brought up, that we all danced at home. So I think we can all dance here, whatever the age. Ladies in my troop, what, in the 70s, 80s, all good. Still moving, still mobile, still smiling, still enjoying life. And that's what it's about.